Wow, that was such a nice introduction. The one thing that I should clarify is that I also have a one-year-old, so I, in fact, do not sleep. <laughs> uh, so we're going to talk a little bit differently than some of the other sessions have been today, um, because I, I really admire people who have figured out all these platforms and know how to engage and really know how to use all these tools in, in, in incredible ways. I've loved listening to some of the different presentations. But I tend to look at things in terms of the big picture and trends and patterns. And you know, if you read the headlines these days, things aren't really looking so good. You know, for a long time there was a, just to give you a little bit of a spoiler of what my talk is going to be. Okay, <laughs> if you read the headlines, if you read the news, uh, it sort of feels like uh, that catchphrase that the early adopters used to all use, which was "move fast and break things." has been working a little bit too well, right? Everything kind of seems broken. Facebook, whose slogan that was, basically seems to have almost broken democracy itself. So with everything so broken, the question becomes, what do we talk about at Social Media Week? Where are things going? My answer to that is, uh, I think we need to start talking about fixing things. And that's where we begin. So where it all began and what it could have been. Uh, if you think back to the early days of the digital world, social media was promising to connect us to like minds. It was going to help us reconnect with friends and family around the globe, to connect with people who had shared ideas and ideals. The whole premise was if you, you, know, if you were bullied by the kids on your street or if you were someone who was an outsider or didn't fit in, instead of having to be uh, friends with the people who lived near you, you could find your communities of like minds anywhere on Earth. There was the potential that these tools could help bring democracy to corners of the world that were uh, led by authoritarian regimes. There was so much hope. Uh, and we did a lot of good. You know, the early stages of all this was the beginning of Web 2.0. Web 1.0 was pretty static, right? It was Netflix and web pages that maybe had hyperlinks but weren't truly interactive in the way that social media and wikis and blogs were. These were tools that let us shape the internet. It wasn't just surfing the internet. It became our platform, our medium, a new world, and in essence, an extension of the world that we live in on a daily basis. The good that came of it, we really did level the playing field. Those traditional gatekeepers of media who weren't necessarily inclusive in terms of who they let be on the big screen or on mass media, all of a sudden we had an opportunity to get past them. And if you look at how trends in media have changed, it's not necessarily that decision makers have become more altruistic over time. They've seen that people can go and create their own audience, pe audiences. People said, you know what, I'm not gi being given an opportunity on these traditional platforms. I'm going to do it for myself. I'm going to do it on YouTube. I'm going to do it on Instagram. And mainstream media caught on and said, huh, maybe there's profit to be made from this. Uh, there was a connecting of like minds. There was a democratization of ideas. All of this happened. There was the phenomenon of the more, the more. There's a very collaborative spirit when the internet works well. And what I mean by the more, the more is if you look at the pattern of YouTubers compared to uh, traditional, the way traditional media works, you see often that YouTubers will collaborate with each other, and that's how they build their audiences. Now, if you think of traditional media, think of prime time, where there's you know, between 7.30 and 9, there's maybe three spots less if you're thinking about hour-long productions. And so people, especially if you're similar, are competing with each other, as opposed to in the uh, algorithm economy, which you know, this is maybe the, the, the last thing that I will say that's pro-algorithm economy for a while. But if someone was similar to you, it was going to drive more views to you. So there was a lot of collaboration. Then there was this idea of cognitive surplus. This uh, is an idea that was introduced by Clay Shirky about 10 years ago, at this time when we were really in the early days of Web 2.0 and at, of the sort of true collaborative internet. And the notion of cognitive surplus was that thanks to technology, consumers were becoming creators. It was what we were doing with our spare time. And this was phenomenal. In this book, he documented the fact that in a fraction of the time that we spend watching TV, we had built Wikipedia. And imagine the things that we could build together for fun, because we wanted to, instead of just consuming all the time. We were connected. So around this time again, I had finished grad school. I was working for PBS Frontline on a project called Digital Nation. And I had the opportunity to go to BlizzCon. And I don't know if there's any gamers in this room, but BlizzCon is the big conference in Anaheim for uh, World of Warcraft and Diablo. 
And it was phenomenal. Here's an event that had 30,000 people at it. It had sold out in 20 seconds. So this was a community that wanted to get together. And the reason that tickets uh, go so fast is, yes, they want to see what the next expansion is. But more than that, these were guilds of players who lived in different areas of the country, sometimes of the world. And this was that annual mecca. This was the opportunity for them all to meet up face to face. And the stories that I heard were phenomenal. I, I, I don't think it's, it's uh, overstating things to say that for me, it was life-changing. It was certainly, uh, in terms of my career, it set me on a certain path in that mainstream media, again, was showing us pictures of gamers who were down their parents' basements in ketchup or tomato sauce covered undershirts and just staring at computer screens. Meanwhile, in this room, there was grandparents with their kids. There was people pushing baby carriages because they had met in the game and fallen in love and gotten married. There were... Uh, people who told me stories about helping each other's kids. These are, you know, the people who played in the same game the guild as them in World of Warcraft, helping each other's kids write their college admission papers of mourning when there was a death in each other's family or celebrating births together. This cannot be, we, I cannot underscore this enough, the value that came out of human connection and the value of collaborative uh, experiences. This is what we live for. We want to be something that's part of something that's bigger than ourselves. Now, I know everyone in this room is also familiar with the fact that there's been a lot of hand-wringing over this, right? We have all heard so many times that we're staring into screens instead of looking into each other's eyes, right? Well, I would argue that this has nothing, that, that didn't start with our screens. It didn't start with video games. In fact, it goes back decades. Uh, this is a phenomenon. There's a psychologist in Ottawa uh, named Sue Johnson who talks about a tsunami of loneliness. And it is going on. We do see it. But I don't know that tech is singularly to blame. Um, if you go back decades, uh, there's a book called Bowling Alone by an author named Ro Robert Putnam. And he talks about the fact that in the 1950s, so I'm just going to have a sip of water, the 1950s, the era of family values, right? Leave it to Beaver and Lassie. Uh, that's when we got cars and got TVs and moved to the suburbs. So I'm going to have a sip of water and then I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> explain how all this makes sense. So we got our cars, we got our TVs, we moved to the suburbs. Obviously, I wasn't there, but we collectively did. And what ended up... Oh my God, I'm so addicted to my phone that I picked it up just because I was standing next to it. Uh, we got our car. <laughs> uh, little aside, I always joke about being a cyborg, even though it is not physically embedded in my body, it is always connected to me, uh, but I have my clicker now. Uh, so we got our cars, we got TVs, and we moved to the suburbs. And what that meant was that instead of walking into town to get groceries, instead of walking up the street and saying hi to your neighbors and knowing your community when you were going on your way to work, we were commuting. You were living in the suburbs, driving into work. When you got home, you had dinner together. You had dinner in front of the TV often with TV meals. But community as it had existed before that collapsed. And that's the title of the book, Bowling Alone. Things like bowling leagues and bake sales, these things that had been the foundation of community disappeared. And yet our desire for them, our need for them still existed. So naturally, when you see things like massive multiplayer online games or social networks, we we ran towards them. Uh, all to say, this hand-wringing, I think, we always, <laughs> we're always bad at being introspective and really identifying where the source of a problem originates. People also love to point fingers, and one of my favorite topics to examine is selfies, and I think also this is a great audience <laughs> to, to talk about this with. So selfies, when they first came about, people pointed fingers and wanted to criticize and said that they were narcissistic and self-indulgent, but this was missing uh, really the driving, f I think it was a, t a massive misunderstanding of the social media generation. I remember being in a room of digital producers, right? So this isn't television producers, this is people creating content for the internet. And they were all just railing against selfies. This was a couple days after, and we know these happen every six months, these viral stories of death by selfie because someone has fallen off a cliff or someone has fallen off the side of a building. And all of a sudden it becomes a huge phenomenon and they were making fun of this. But I'm sure everyone in this room knows that if you're working online, you don't make fun of your art audience. That's the cardinal sin. That's the number one rule. Understand what motivates them. 
understand what the appeal is. And as researchers have started following selfies, digging into selfies, what you find it is, it is a medium of activism. It is a way to speak out against the status quo, to t take control of our own image, uh, and to push back against uh, this sort of, you know, I'm a media professor, and I, my undergraduate degree was in film, and you know, we're taught about in film theory the male gaze. That is, you know, the sort of quintessential example of the male gaze is the shower scene in Psycho, where there's a woman and a knife, and it's all being watched by this person who has traditionally had control of media. Well, all of a sudden, people are saying, I want to frame the image around me. I want to show the world who I am and what I look like. Uh, the other piece of this is that for a lot of the people who were railing against selfies, they weren't good at change and they were stuck in the past. Case in point, uh, there was a lot of traditional institutions, the Cannes Film Festival, they banned the selfie stick. Okay, well that made a lot of headlines and it made people uh, kind of scoff their noses at selfies, but they also forced women to wear high heels the same year. They were out of touch with change. Now. Talking about change, we often can't see the forest for the trees. There's a Marshall McLuhan expression that a fish doesn't know it's swimming in water. We're not really good at seeing the world around us uh, or seeing things change. And this is true of the critics who didn't understand how these new tools, how social media and our connective platforms were being used to change the world, the sort of notion of power to the people. But it's also true for us missing how in parallel the platforms that were driving all of this were benefiting, how they were gaining control over our attention and our data. And so, for as much as we talk about not being able to see the forest as you're staring at that tree, or being that fish that's in water that doesn't know that it's in water, have you heard the analogy of the frog? So, <laughs> I hate this story, and yet it is so evocative. Uh, if you put a frog into a pot of boiling water, it will immediately jump out. But if you put a frog into a pot of cold water, and slowly turn up the temperature so it gets warmer and warmer to the point of boiling, the frog will die. And unfortunately, that sort of brings us to the moment that we're at now. I went from keynote to PowerPoint, and this is what happens. <laughs> we are on the verge of a dystopia. And the worst part about this is that we got here without really ever having consented to this in any kind of informed way, right? We weren't asked, we weren't told what the repercussions were gonna be. I see people taking pictures, maybe I'll go back for one second. <laughs> this is important, I think this is a message that we all need to get behind. The reason for this, the reason that we got to this space without, in, without really understanding that it was happening, certainly without really offering buy-in, is that technology advances exponentially. It doesn't advance at a linear pace. It doesn't advance, you know, humans and natural life forms advance at a linear pace. We grow year by year, but it exponentially means two and then four. It's a constant doubling where the last five years don't prepare us for the next five years, certainly, but it's not something that we can wrap our heads around because there's nothing to help us prepare for it. It's not a human uh, pace of progress. But it's not just the pace of technology that's brought us to this moment, it's also the predominant business model of our era, which is can it scale, right? You've heard this a million times. Can it scale? Can it scale? Scaling has been the driving uh, sort of momentum of all of these companies without thinking of the fact that sometimes when you scale too quickly, there are massive unintended, unintended consequences. So you've got companies like Facebook and Google, YouTube, that whole ecosystem, Amazon, that wanted to scale, and because they were scaling so quickly, they needed to bring in automation. Case in point, and again, I think that these are statistics that this audience, being a social media audience, is familiar with. You know, there's more content posted to YouTube every hour than we can watch in a lifetime, which means it is really hard to have humans moderating all of that. It would, they would, you know, it, it's certainly not cost effective, and that's, you know, when we're talking about scaling, we're talking about money, we're talking about making profit. Uh, but even in terms of the instantaneous need and nature, the trouble is when we bring in automation, when we bring in algorithms, no one was thinking about a few key 
factors. No one was thinking about who was creating those algorithms and what their biases might be and what their blind spots might be and what could possibly go wrong when we leave really important decisions, societal decisions, global decisions, uh, to automated systems where there's no human input or no human intervention. In parallel with all of this, with all of this scaling and massive growth, social media was no longer just for the early adopters. And I want to say here, I'm not talking about being elitist. I'm not talking about it, oh, it was no longer just for the cool kids and kids wanted to get off Facebook because mom and grandma were on it. I actually think it's good. I think it's great that everyone wanted to be connected and wanted to use all these platforms for all the reasons we were talking about before. We can access information. We can connect with each other. There's joy that comes from all of these things. We actually, the same cuddle chemical that gets released when we hug and embrace uh, is released in our brain when someone likes one of our posts or when we get a, a nice email. It's, it makes us feel good. It is uh, sort of chemically part of what it means to be human. The problem is when everyone was on social media, all of a sudden platforms like Facebook were so big that they had unprecedented power. And this is a phenomenon called the network effect. The basic concept of the network effect is the idea that once the majority of people and businesses and resources are together in one place, no one else can compete, right? If you know that there's a 90% likelihood that the businesses that you're trying to connect with are on one platform, we're not going to use other platforms. It's not convenient. And so that's where there becomes this monopoly. Or if you want to think about another way, the new oligarchs that come about because control becomes more and more and more centralized till it's held in the hands of only a few. And this is when things started to really shift, right? Here we were in a medium, in a movement, in an era that was supposed to be power to the people. We were given tools that were giving us the opportunity to take control, and yet there was an unprecedented control of that information and access to each other by just a few organizations. So, and again, speaking to this room, I think that a lot of people, when we talk about kind of the sadness or anxiety that's going on in this time, this is when things started to shift because creators couldn't access their fans anymore. People had ported their mailing lists over to Facebook because of the promise of, you know, being able to access them and communicate with them more readily. And all of a sudden, Facebook was taking them hostage. There are stories of people who have uh, fan groups of two million that all of a sudden were reaching 20 people with a post and unless they were going to pay tens of thousands of dollars to reach those people. This is not advertising. This is reaching a community that has opted in to hear from you. But they understood all of a sudden that there was algorithms that could drive, drive a monetary uh, process. And so clicks started going down, and eyeballs started going down. But there was also more concerning uh, shifts that started going on, right? Algorithms started making decisions without human input. Uh, one of the examples, gosh, I can't remember how long ago this was, but it was one of the early examples where I think some red flags started going up. That historically significant photo of the napalm girl was banned. It was pulled down by Facebook. There was a rape that was live streamed. And then, as we've seen most recently this year, our information has been starting, uh, has been used against us to manipulate us into voting specific ways, right? This was the whole Cambridge Analytica scandal, where seemingly inane information, this was not like, uh, you know, you having identified which political party you were going to vote for. This was like, did you like the page for Hello Kitty and the Colbert Report and pizza? Well, we know who you are and we know your behaviors better than you know yourself and we are then going to manipulate to you, you to certain ends. It sounds really dark and <laughs> it's not fiction. Uh, and it all happens so fast that even those of us who have been trying to keep up with it, who have been keeping up with it, feel bewildered. There is anxiety, right? Democracy is under attack. I'm talking about this in, in past tense, but it's, you know, we're, we're sort of in this moment right now. Uh, people were starting to feel anxious and depressed. There was a lot of FOMO, a lot of fear of missing out, right? What this, this sort of phenomenon that we're living in is it's Saturday night and you're in your pajamas and you're scrolling through people's feeds, looking at their Insta-perfect lives and you've got a bowl of ice cream on your chest and your hand is in a bag of chips. But guess what? Same with them. There was this whole... Oh, there's nothing I just, I, you know what, this actually looks better than this slide here. This one's a little, a little cropped. Uh, there was a, a sort of 
mythical reality that we started living in, where people's lives were different than their realities. We were projecting things forward. And people started also getting angry. This is something that we're seeing on all the social media platforms. It's something that's making it less pleasurable to be in these places, and also having huge repercussions, pushing creators and pushing people, uh, um, uh, leading thinkers off of some of these platforms because they're such hostile spaces. Uh, our shared experiences, that which the internet was uh, built to create, built to foster, started disappearing. And it worked like this. You know, originally there was the concept of the filter bubble. The th filter bubble is the idea that we get our information from our social feeds, which tends to be people who we went to school with or who are our friends, maybe our family. It's people who think like us, probably act like us and vote like us. So we weren't getting access to broader information that's out there. It's not like if you traditionally, and you know, there's, we can debate this for days about the objectivity of traditional print newspapers, but it wasn't like we were getting any kind of objective information. We were choosing what we wanted to see, or if we were getting information, we were getting it from people who also thought about the world the same way that we did, except for maybe that one uncle who was in your feed who sometimes posed something that you were just like, oh my god. <laughs> uh, but then, based on sort of the way that we responded to these filter bubbles, uh, it became a model that the algorithm started learning from, right? And so we had further personalized news feeds where everything that was being shown to us was things that we would like. And from the personalized news feeds, we got to what I would arguably say is the tipping point, which is where that information that was targeted to us no longer even needed to be real. It just had to be stuff we wanted to see. So we were so much in these echo chambers, or we're so much now in these echo chambers of people who just think like us, that these same platforms that had been used to uh, give voices to diverse creators, to foster niche communities, were also being used by extremists with violent views, and for the first time since it became unacceptable to burn a cross on someone's front lawn or to put a swastika on the side of a building, hate all of a sudden has a place to congregate again. Yeah, it's a bad place. <laughs> but this is not the end of my talk. Believe it or not, I'm an optimist. Um, I'm a cautious optimist. This is a term I heard someone use probably about 10 years ago now, and I thought, God, that's really smart. That's really smart, and that's something, that's what, that's what I am. I'm a cautious optimist. I am uh, defiant in my view that we, there I go again, I almost picked up my phone again. Uh, in my view that we can, make the, we can fix all this, we can make the world better. We have the tools. This is the irony, and I think it's what's so troubling and so frustrating, is that we have the tools to make change, and yet those tools are also um, part of the problem right now. The thing with social media to keep in mind is that it is us, right? We are the engine. We are the product. We are the content. We are the users. These platforms have uh, sort of infrastructure, but other than that, they wouldn't exist if it weren't for the media that we create, that we, of our own accord, without getting paid for, put up. Then we consume it, we engage with it, but we are everything in this process, and we do not give ourselves enough credit. We're not taking advantage of this. We are the way forward. And in this sense, we have more control than we think. So when I talk about escaping this dystopia, which I would say, you know, when I say uh, I'm an optimist, I don't think we're quite at the dystopia there yet, but we're really, really close. And that's where it sometimes feels like we're already there, because we're so close that that's scary, and it feels like the pendulum could swing uh, in any direction without us really having control. That's what it feels like. Uh, and yet I, I do think we have control. Uh, what we need to do right now is to regain control of our data. And the way that we do that is to regain control of our attention. So I brought up uh, nostalgia a little bit earlier when we were talking about the 1950s and the era of family values. Nostalgia is a funny thing. I would say nostalgia can be dangerous, right? Don't get me wrong, when I say nostalgia, I'm not talking about history. History is vital. History is very, very important. But the trouble with nostalgia is we tend to look towards the past with rose-colored glasses where we don't remember things as they really were. And unfortunately, we don't remember the things we overcame and the lessons that we learned in the process. The thing is, 
the world is moving forward, right? We cannot stop the march of time, and I would argue we absolutely do not want to. The world is connected, and there's no going backwards. Yes, we need to push back right now against the overreach of a very small number of massive tech companies, but we also have to remember that this is a very privileged position for us to be in right now because uh, there's also a huge decline in internet freedoms around the world right now. There are authoritarian governments that are using data and surveillance to cut back on the freedoms of their populations, and this is what we have to avoid. This is what we've seen in history and we, what we don't want to repeat. Change is scary. Change is hard, but it is happening. When we talk about change, you know, when it comes to technology, one of the great examples to use is this notion of the singularity. And the thing about the singularity as a concept is it's that moment on the horizon that you can't see past. You know, a horizon line, we don't know what's on the other side of it. It's the reason that people thought that the world was flat, because it doesn't give you any indication of what's beyond it. So the singularity is this moment where life, because of technology, because of AI, will advance to such a point that it is unrecognizable to those of us living in today's world. This is something that you know, futurists like Ray Kurzweil say will happen within our lifetime, from my daughter who's now one, maybe around the time that she's in college. And lest this sound like science fiction or just a bunch of crazy futurists, uh, the World Economic Forum says that for kids who are entering school today, 65% of them are gonna work in jobs that don't currently exist. That's staggering, right? And if you think of someone who's what, five or six years younger, my daughter, that's probably up near 80%. Things are changing. And this means, my thought is that the way we move forward is to really understand how things have already changed. That if we can understand the status quo and the shifts that have already happened, that's how we can both understand the changes that are happening ahead of us, but also, and more importantly, if there's anything that I wanna underscore in this, it is shape the change that's happening. And so this is what I'm going to walk you through from everything that I've observed over, I'd say, a decade plus in this space. Uh, the things that never really needed an explanation, these principles that sort of drive the contemporary world, have shifted and they need a bit of an explanation. So I'll start with power, right? Power is a big driving principle in the world. Power now is information. So again, about eight years ago, seven years ago, I remember being in an interview where I was told by a, a privacy expert, security expert, uh, about this uh, insurance company CEO. And he had said that he only paid for fast food using cash. Uh, and so here we go, fast forward to this year. Uh, John Hancock, one of the biggest insurance providers in the world, has said they will only provide coverage to people who use personal trackers. This CEO, he knew, he was on the inside, he had information, information is power, he knew where things were going. So there's people right now who will say, well, I'm really healthy, and I never eat fast food, I maybe have like one you know, box of Timbits a year, or one Big Mac a year, but by and large, I'm really healthy, I'm really active, I'm gonna get a lower premium for doing this. But the skeptics are gonna say, I don't know, if it can be used for good, we've been seeing this, there's a precedent for this, it could be used against you. So you have a heart attack and all of a sudden, because of your credit card records, you know, you had a Big Mac last year. We're not gonna cover it. Information is power, knowledge is power. Talking about power, right? Power and money, they go hand in hand. Currency, what is currency? I would argue uh, that data has become currency. We have been told that we live in the attention economy, that it's all about clicks and eyeballs. Uh, I think that's a little bit of a fallacy because it's the aggregate of those clicks and eyeballs. It's what those clicks and eyeballs tell us. It's the profiles they create on us. It's the information, the pictures that they paint. It's the, in, it's the, it's the data that's there. So uh, I wrote an article, I think, last year on this phenomenon of data being the new oil. The idea that the biggest, most profitable companies in the world aren't making tangible things, they're not making tangible products, but they're dealing in a currency of data, and that data is ours. You know, free isn't free anymore. I think everyone's familiar with the notion that if you are using something that is free, you are the product, and that's why now we're seeing this interest in the notion of decentralization. Uh, and decentralization, we won't get into sort of 
cryptocurrency and blockchain and all of that, but the idea of decentralization is that instead of all of our likes being translated to dollars that are going into the piggy banks of a few organizations, we could own our information, we could control our data, uh, and it could exist in sort of pods or in a distributed way where we could, in essence, try and rebuild this kind of infrastructure that we're working with online. Uh, so, from currency to value. Now, I'm talking about currency and value as two different things. Well, I would say, yes, it's absolutely true that there is arguably monetary value for data. Uh, when we talk about value, it also is this notion of scarcity and abundance, right? That which we do not have is valuable. What don't we have, right? This goes back to that slide I, did, I had on uh, the filter bubble and on personalized news feeds and on fake news. We don't have trust. Trust is at an all-time low. There's a fascinating phenomenon right now where major financial institutions, major corporate institutions, are all trying to poach the top journalists. They all want journalists in their organizations. Not even marketing people, because what they realize they need to do is get people to trust them. They're no longer pitching and hard selling and trying to uh, talk people into, into whatever it is that they're trying to sell. They're just trying to get back this thing that is so, so scarce and so, so valuable. Misinformation is rampant. It is probably one of the biggest issues we're dealing with as a culture at this moment, in that you know everyone has their own idea of what's going on in the world, even though half of the time it's fictional. Uh, and so this idea of truth having value is really important, I would say, for anyone who's working in the social media space, thinking through how you can uh, reestablish trust. I think a lot of it has to do with uh, having respect for the audience and having a reciprocal relationship with that audience, knowing that if they are giving you their time and their eyeballs, that you need to be reciprocal with it. Now, yes, okay, you say something really sensationalist and it's fake and you get people to believe it and there's content farms making lots of money off of this, but that's not gonna solve problems right now. Uh, who's in charge? This is a really good question. You know, I could say it's the big tech companies and maybe that's true, although they would say, they don't know what's going on. You know, anything, anytime things go awry, anytime there's a scandal, which I would say is, you know, once a week, it's either Facebook or Amazon or Google that's in the headlines for some new thing gone wrong, they would say, oh, well, well we didn't know. You know, they, they feign ignorance. So we're not in charge. So then who is it? Is it their boards? Maybe, you know, board of directors. Is it government regulation? Arguably, it should be more than it is now, right? There's no one holding these companies accountable. There's no pushback. They're starting to be a little bit. But more than anything, I would say it is us. Remember, we are the users, we are the content, we are the engine of social media. We are just not fully wielding our power for the change that we want to see just yet. And it's not our fault. I'm not pointing fingers. This is because it has all happened so quickly. It is because we've been f uh, following a timeline that has been uh, created by tech and following a, a timeline that's been driven by this notion of scaling, which is not a human uh, pace of change. The other thing that's really changing is borders, right? The major social media platforms or the, ma you know, the sort of big five tech companies are bigger than uh, any country. You know, they've got two billion years, they're richer than any country. And so this fundamentally changes the notion of, uh, you know, where we congregate, where we live, what borders are. Oops, let me go back for a second. However, uh, there are some ways that, again, when I talked about who's in charge, there, is, there are some interesting examples of regulation. So for example, last year, the GDPR came about, which was the privacy regulations uh, coming out of Europe. And yes, they made things difficult. I'm sure they made things difficult for many people in this room who had to change policies and make people aware and maybe you know, lost half of their mailing lists in the process. But the interesting thing is that in terms of uh, sort of broader trends, in terms of people's privacy and the consent, you know how I say we didn't consent to this moment? In terms of the ability to have a decision about the direction things are heading in, the GDPR was really helpful in that. Now, when I talk about borders, the interesting thing about being in a arguably borderless world is that even though the GDPR was European regulation, it's having a trickle-down effect on those of us in Canada, people in the US, because companies weren't going to go and make different policies most of the time for different countries. So if they were doing a business with Europe, let's say 
Facebook or Google, if they were doing business in Europe and had to change their policies for the GDPR, we would uh, just sort of, in a second-hand way, benefit from that as well. Now, this can also work in the opposite direction. As I mentioned, internet freedoms have gone down for the eighth consecutive year around the world. There's 18 countries. There's a report from uh, a think tank in the US called Freedom House that said last year, I think 18 countries saw a decline in internet freedoms that has to do with uh, limiting what information people can share, what information people can access, surveillance like we've never experienced before, uh, giving people scores based on a combination of their real world behaviors and their online behaviors, scary stuff. And for companies that are doing business with those governments, if they change their policies in a universal way to be in accordance with them, that could have a trickle-down effect on us as well. So here we are with, the, with Canadian freedoms, and yet if we are using tools that are arguably borderless, there's some good and there's some bad that will come from it. Uh, I want to touch on skills for a little bit, partially because I think this is another area where there's a lot of anxiety, right? Skills, if you are working in social media, it feels like every time there's a new product, you have to learn how to use it. We don't have enough time in the day. Uh, you know, we're told about automation that's going to take away all of our jobs. I think the, some of the most important things from the discussions that I have with industry, with, uh, again, sort of think tanks, watching students, seeing uh, patterns of change over time, some of the most valuable things that you can be fostering are uh, clarity. There is so much noise. So being able to cut through that, both as a communicator and as a researcher, it's sort of in terms of uh, da the data flow, right? Bad data in means bad data out. So you need to be able to, to have some kind of clarity amidst all the noise. This is also really relevant when it comes to the whole phenomenon of misinformation and fake news, right? How do you... Uh, keep an even, an even path forward. Uh, the other thing is um, clarity and focus. There are so many distractions. It is so easy to pick up every, your phone every time that you're near it, right? I'm an example of it. But focus and clarity are going to be increasingly essential with every passing year. On top of this, uh, you know, problem solving is a, another really big area, creative problem solving. And there's been a fascinating switch. So I teach in the Faculty of Communication and Design at Ryerson. And as uh, Michelle was mentioning at the beginning, I'm the director of the Innovation Studio, which is our hub of three creative incubators. So it's people who are working in creative communication spaces, using technology, trying to push boundaries and innovate. And what's been fascinating to see is where even as much as five years ago, as recently as five years ago, people were talking about the need of STEM skills. Everyone was going to have to know how to program AI and work alongside robots, whereas now we're seeing a shift in that what's really valuable is problem solving. Certainly, if this talk hasn't, <laughs> hasn't made the case for why we need to be problem solvers, I don't know what will. Uh, but also creativity, uh, the things that are innately human, human skills, the things that computers and machines uh, can't do. So I, you know, I encourage you to, when you do have a moment, to check out some of the projects and some of the teams and some of the work that they're exhibiting because they're fascinating projects. They're working in VR. They're working in podcasts and new platforms. Some of them, some of them are working in fashion and in music and different disciplines. But they're also trying to tackle some of these big problems. You know, creating for niche communities, having respect for your audience, and there's some fascinating learning outcomes that come from all of this. Uh, finally, and this is the last slide I'm going to leave you with. I think maybe the most important is speed, or our concept of time. We have gotten into this pattern where the pace of our lives is dictated by timelines, and it is that go by very, very quickly. And it is dictated by technology, which advances exponentially. Here we are, the creators of these tools, and yet we have adapted to keep up with the pace of machines as opposed to our natural human biological clocks, our natural human, the pace of human lives, slow down. I promise you, this is probably the most, most, most important thing uh, that we can do. When we slow down, we're able to regain control of our attention a little bit, which means we're also able to regain control of our data in the process. This will help us uh, fight the spread of misinformation. <laughs> there was a, a report that said that uh, Six out of 10 times, people will share an article oops, based on its headline alone. And I, we're all guilty of it, right? We've all done it. We're not reading everything that we're sharing. This is how fake news spreads. 
sometimes those articles don't even have the content that they say is in the article based on the headline. If we slow down, we will be halfway to solving the problem of the spread of fake news. The other piece of this is, as I mentioned off the very top of my talk, it was Facebook's, you know, you, you, you have to recognize also that they were very quiet about uh, changing their slogan over at Facebook. I think that they realized that they maybe were breaking too many things in the process. But this idea of moving fast and breaking things, well, here we are. We are at the stage where arguably the way we access information and even democracy itself is close to being broken. So we need to slow down. It will serve us well. The other thing that it does is it buys us some time. We're not at the dystopia yet. We're not living in a dystopia, but we are very, very close. And if we continue to move forward at this breakneck, breakneck pace that's driven by uh, sort of exponential growth and uh, scaling, scaling, let's keep scaling without thinking about the consequences or without thinking if it even makes our platforms better, uh, all of a sudden it will just hurtle into the, the abyss. But if we can slow down a little bit, it gives us the opportunity to reflect on our values, reflect on what's important to us. And I would say, <sighs> gain the benefits that these tools promise to us, to be able to connect, to be able to collaborate, to be creative, to see the democratization, uh, uh, democratization of ideas and ideals, to be able to fight back on uh, sort of authoritarian leadership or regimes or ideals. There is so much good that comes from these tools, but we're moving too fast, which means we're not the ones who are uh, making decisions right now. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, I, I guess if there's, I think that there might be time if there are any questions. I see Michelle's right here. For questions, we've got about 10 minutes, so I'm sure that uh, people in here do have questions for you. We've got Mike Renners. I think there's one back there, but maybe he was just scratching his head. Yeah, oh, there he is. <laughs> Hi, thanks. Thanks for the presentation. I was just curious, you're, um, you studied film in your undergraduate degree. Yeah. Really into visual images, and yet in your presentation there was only text, and mm -hmm. I was wondering why you made that choice. So, I, I, it's a great... Uh, this is a great question. I always do very, very visual decks. This was actually a, a big departure for me. Uh, there's two things. One is um, I also really like simplicity. So when I, I don't like a lot of text on presentations. Uh, so I really like simple decks. Usually I use very, very visual slides. Uh, I felt like for this talk, you know, sometimes things are so specific that the images really come in handy. I feel like for this content, it's so... Um, it's so visceral, and I think it's so timely, we're all living this right now, that, you know, a stock image of a computer hand touching a human hand wasn't going to do it justice. Uh, the idea of sort of building up the colors according to the, you know, level of, what is like the, the bomb scare, the level of concern, um, do you know what I'm talking about? You know, when it goes like it's a, the threat level is yellow, the threat level is orange, the threat level of red. I just, I know that we've all got these images in our brains, so it was sort of more that. It was just, I think that there's sometimes opportunities. This is, I think, also kind of storytelling 101, is sometimes you want to visually tell the story so that there's no room for ambiguity, no room to fill in the gaps, but I think quite often, um, you know, we bring our personal experiences to things, and so I, I, I just, I, I think that this, this felt to me like a place where the, the images weren't going to do uh, justice to what people already had, what people knew. I don't know. Was it successful? <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, yeah. I think there's a mic coming. Hi, Ramona. Hi. Um, I was wondering what are some of the things you do personally to regain control of your own attention span? That's a great question. So, um, I've taken, for starters, I've taken Facebook off my phone. I've taken a lot of things off my phone just because at least then if I'm picking it up, I'm not using them. It forces me to like log into a browser, which is really inconvenient. It just adds a few more steps in between. Um, my husband and I have a code word for when we're using our devices too much in front of our daughter. And it's hard because, so this is another, here's another, you know, I, I was focusing on social media, but there's, 
There's a story that I love to tell that goes back to when I was working on Digital Nation with Frontline as well, which was, uh, this was like, there, there were no iPhones yet, this was Blackberries, and this is more about sort of connectivity, but I remember interviewing a woman who was a professional, and had little kids, and they played soccer, and she used to miss the soccer games because she had to be at work. And all of a sudden, she had her Blackberry, and she was able to make it to those soccer games. And there was a day where she was at the soccer game, and she was responding to something from her boss, and she heard all this cheering, and she looked up, and she realized that her kid had just scored this massive winning goal. Um, but he was like totally crestfallen because she had missed it, because she'd been texting. And it was just this, it's this debate that I think we're still living in, which is, you know, physical presence versus kind of mental presence, conscious presence. And it had before that, even though she wasn't able to be at the soccer game, he would come home and over dinner he would tell her and she was there and she was engaged the full time as he was recounting this experience. And all of a sudden, yes, she was there, but she had missed it and he was hurt. And I still come back to that because I don't think that we have solved that. In some ways we may be, you know, we all kind of have our personal rules, but widely we certainly don't have sort of like etiquette for the 21st century around it. Um, so, okay, Did that, I know that doesn't answer your question. It just speaks to my internal debate as well. I think the first thing is just, I, I don't know that the answer is leaving the platforms, um, at least until there's other, uh, other options. Although, if you want to, more power to you. <laughs> uh, but I do think cutting back, you know, the other thing I didn't talk about when I talked about time and speed is this kind of myth about synchronicity versus asynchronicity. There's a fabulous book by Douglas Rushkoff called Programmer Be Programmed, and he talks about uh, time and asynchronicity. And, and just to, to like give you the very condensed version of this, it used to be that communication was all synchronous. So someone phoned you, you picked up the phone, you were in the middle of writing a document, in the middle of writing a proposal, in the middle of doing whatever you were doing, and you were distracted and you had that call. Then when the internet came about, we had control of our time because you know it was dial-up and it was very slow, but you would do it a couple times a day and you would get your messages and you would communicate maybe in the morning, then do your work and at lunch and then do your work. And it was phenomenal. And then we got these devices with push notifications, which were supposedly you know, advancing, you know, efficiencies and solving all sorts of problems, but they brought that first problem that we were originally trying to solve for, which was being distracted and being um, interrupted, and all of a sudden it was like 10,000-fold, because every time there was a notification. So I think it's just thinking through uh, turning off all the notifications that you don't need. You know, yes, if there's something from a parent or a babysitter or something or a boss, you can be getting those, but there's really no reason that these devices need to be dictating the pace of our lives. There's no re you know, we, we've started to think that there's an urgency over it, of like, what happens if this person has reached me and I haven't, you know, I think we can have conversations with each other around like, I'll get back to you as soon as I can when I'm not at work or when I'm out of the meeting, but just give it a few minutes. It's the same kind of phenomenon that's led to like, I'll take down a post if someone doesn't like it within, you know, by the end of the day or within an hour. You know, these are sort of stories that, that or, or uh, reactions that you hear and that are collected. So I, it's really um, anything that you can do to push back against uh, this n new, or the, artif the technology-driven notion of time is really important. So I think a few things, like turning off notifications, maybe taking things off of your phone, still accessing them, but having control over when you access them. I, I have a question, actually, as well, and yeah. I, I, maybe more of a comment question, yeah. but do you think that um, awareness is, is part of it as well? I saw, um, I forgot who it was, and if he was from Face, a former uh, exec from Facebook mm -hmm. or Apple, but he was developing something sort of, sim sort of similar to how Apple Watch has metrics around your biometrics. Mm -hmm actual feedback that you could Im implement in your device that would actually tell you about your usage. So I I'm seeing more and more of this, and I think there are ways that we can start actually becoming more aware of how much time we're spending on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, in chat, you know, browsing various yeah. news sites. And do you think that if we become more aware of the time that we're spending, do you think people will be surprised? Will it be more than what we thought, less? So I think it's a great idea. It's actually, when I teach an interaction design course, which I haven't, I didn't teach this year, it's the first assignment that I give students. And I used to just say, like, keep a spreadsheet. And just mark, you know, when you're trying to change your dietary habits, or if you think that there's something that you're Count eating calories. that you- yeah, Counting, or yeah. even just like, I have a rash, or I have a stomach ache, and I want to figure out what it is. You, we don't know what we eat, and so you track it. And I think it's the same thing. We don't know what we 
we consume without thinking about what we consume, and that's true of everything that we consume. <laughs> There's all sorts, there are a ton of apps that you can download now, but even I think with the latest OS, I mean, I know weekly Apple is telling me about my usage, although I'm not sure I trust it because every week it tells me that my screen time is going down, and I'm not sure that that's true, <laughs> but maybe it is. Not this week, that's it's for just, sure. Yeah, it's just like feeding, it's like feeding into this myth of like, you're doing better, keep going. <laughs> I think we can take one or two more questions. Yeah? Just wait for the mic, she'll be right there. Is it on? Oh, hi. hi. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, thanks. So congratulations because you're a recent mom. Thank you. Uh, my daughter turns one next week. And congratulations to you. Thank you. you. Uh, a big debate at home has been how much screen time we allow for her and how mm -hmm. much we are also on our phones in front of her. So I wanted to, I have my own opinions, mm -hmm. but what is your opinion on sort of educating her yeah. about phone usage or screen usage and how do you plan or hope to like implement that or phase that into her life? That's a very good question. Um, so the Canadian American Pediatrics Association, everyone says no screens until two. That is the current recommendation. And it's very hard to do. Um, you know, if you read articles, there was a huge buzz over this in the last few weeks, even though this is nothing new. The idea that all of Silicon Valley does not let their kids use the devices that they create. Like 10 years ago, we knew that Steve Jobs didn't let his kids create any of the tools that he, or use any of the tools that he was creating. Um, so that was not really any new information. I saw some interesting backlash to that article, though, which was that this becomes an, an argument of privilege, right? This becomes another way that the Silicon Valley elite and people who are very wealthy are able to push back against everyone else and say, you're doing things wrong and we're doing things right. It's very kind of uh, like evil, elitist, but it's also very kind of like the evil masterminds when they're creating all these very same things also. Um, it, it's, it's hard for people, you know, if you're a single parent and you, you just need a few minutes to make dinner or do the laundry or get a little bit of work done because you have come home early because you've got these devices, which means you can, like, it's complicated. And so the piece of me that's extremely empathic says, we can't judge ourselves too harshly for relying on these tools. You know, I would like to say, and I think I probably have many times in columns, like you cannot let YouTube be your babysitter, especially when you know what makes it through those algorithms and like the vicious Peppa Pig remixes and you like, but, I also feel like life is really hard and really complicated, and so we also don't want to make people feel worse when they do use these tools that they use on a daily basis. So it is really complicated. I mean, I would suggest waiting as long as possible. For us, we don't like sit her in front. We don't we don't do screen time. She doesn't watch TV, and we don't sit her in front of our phones. Um, luckily, she like, loves books, but uh, but I will say, she knows that we're on it all the time and she loves nothing more. Like she's very, she has got like tapping and swiping figured out. She can do slow-mo video. She's just like, she knows that there's certain things she can press that get a reaction. Um, but that, I don't, I don't know, maybe I'm just cutting myself some slack, but I don't really count that as screen time because we're not sort of putting her in front of a kid's app or something like that. There's another, this was actually my radio column yesterday, but there was a report from the UK Children's Commissioner that just came out that was talking about the fact that by the time kids are 13, parents will have posted on average 1,300 photos or videos of them. By the time they turn 18, they will themselves have posted 70,000 social media posts. And the concern is that we don't know the unintended consequences. And if you think again about Cambridge Analytica and how this inane information, right? Like whether you liked have a pig to give a better example now. You know, these, whether you like these ridiculous things were pieced together to create these profiles that were then used to manipulate us. Well, that was when Facebook had only been around for 10 years. If you consider now that it's starting, and this was another part of the report that's quite chilling, you know, six months before that kid is even born because people are posting their scans to social media and then tracking them till 18, the concern is, does this, is this gonna stand in the way of the next generation getting jobs, uh, getting a mortgage, what their credit might be, getting insurance. You know, we, we're seeing again with that John Hancock example, information, you know, we're told, oh, if you're good, it will help you, you got better rates, you'll get all these other things. But, you know, what is, you know, is, is getting a box of donuts really such a bad thing? And it, so it's very complicated. And all to say, I think we need to try and be as cautious and conscious as possible, but I also think we have to be really 
we really have to help each other through this transition time right now because these tools are a part of our lives, right? And so I don't think we want to make people feel worse for relying on them. But if possible, <laughs> I would say try and, try and hold back as much as you can.